Hello and welcome to this webinar on the preservation of photographs. Conservation consists of individual conservation treatments and preservation or care of photographs at collection level. Both are important for continuing to make photographs accessible for people. However, getting decisions right or wrong for photographs at the scale of collections can greatly amplify their life or lack of it. And it's important to consider photographs in context. When I carry out a conservation assessment, the aim is to produce a positive and achievable conservation plan. And this includes assessing the condition and rate of deterioration of the different kinds of photographic material. It takes into account the storage conditions of their use and display. It looks at the importance and significance of different collections and what is achievable within the resources available. All these things are factored into a conservation plan. And I mention this because sometimes people approach me with a simple question such as, how do I rehouse this? And when you look at the whole collection, the answer might be, well, there's not actually that much wrong with this or rehousing won't make too much difference. What you should be doing something about is that part of the collection over there. So I'm going to give you some recommendations for general mixed photographic collections and hopefully in conjunction with the previous videos you should begin to have some idea where your priorities might lie. So let's start with a quick refresher. All preservation measures have to be based on the materials found in photographic collections and I'll just mention a few key points. Of the image forming materials, silver and dyes are likely to be the most common in mixed photographic collections. Whilst high temperatures and relative humidity are likely to increase the rate of deterioration for most materials, silver can also react with some fairly common chemicals and for that reason storage materials tend to have higher specifications than you might find for non-photographic paper-based collections. The emulsions all behave differently with different solvents. However, gelatin is the most responsive to high levels of relative humidity, eventually becoming sticky and blocking to adjacent material. It also has a greater propensity for mould growth at high humidity levels and it's the most likely emulsion to be attacked by insects. Albumin, however, will yellow in alkaline conditions. The supports are also a major factor when considering storage conditions. In the video on negatives, it was clear that there was a considerable variation in stability of different supports, and this gives rise to quite different environmental recommendations. So you can begin to see how the recommendations for storing and displaying photographs come into existence. Silver images and gelatin emulsions are found in virtually all late 19th century, 20th and 21st century collections and so it's particularly important that they're catered for. Now let's have a look at materials used for storage. Firstly, photographs often come with associated housing which can be an integral part of the photograph's history. However, the housing can vary greatly in quality and some sorts of housing are much more detrimental than others. These are typical wallets and photographs from the early to mid 20th century. The photographs, often silver gelatin developed out of prints in these wallets, are often in quite reasonable condition and problems mostly derive from the lack of individual protection and physical damage and dirt caused by taking them out of the wallets or the photographs being compacted in them. So in this instance, the level of use would be an important factor in determining the priority for rehousing, as well as the significance of the wallets themselves. In this example, the sleeve has the photographer's writing on it, it has printed photographic information, which puts it in context, and it has the photographer's technical comment as well. It's also numbered, which ties in with a handwritten catalogue. However, the sleeve is made from a fairly unrefined wood pulp and is likely to cause silver image deterioration. So there is more of a case for rehousing, but also a case for keeping the enclosures. 
On the left here you can see the box containing the negative which we've just seen and there's an arbitrary rule that old wooden boxes have mostly done the damage that they're going to do and therefore chemically there is not necessarily a reason to replace them. Uh, it's not very scientific but we need to start somewhere based on what we can see. So by old we're talking about 50 years plus, as I say it's, it's somewhat arbitrary. However, in this instance, film is stored with glass and it's an important principle to keep different supports and different formats separately. In some cases, this is for reasons of potential physical damage and in others, it's for reasons of chemical damage. So here, as I say, the film is nitrate and the box does not allow much ventilation and the two uh, negative bases need to be separated and stored differently. On the right, this shows glass negatives stored in slots in a wooden box. Wooden boxes, though, can often warp and even a tiny movement means that the slots become very tight. And the negatives are subject to abrasion at the edges each time they're removed, if they can even be removed, and risk breakage. So this is not a good way to keep them. Here you have an album of film negatives in glassine paper sleeves and glassine is a paper that was often used by photographers. It can vary in quality but in this instance it's not too bad. However the date of the negatives needs to be determined and the type of negative identified as far as possible so that the likely rate of deterioration can be anticipated. The negatives may require colder storage and the album may be too bulky for cold storage. There's also the issue of the section cut out of each sleeve for handling and removing the negative. So that's going to cause damage. So the likely use of the negatives needs to be considered. Here we have a box of albums. Apart from the poor chemical composition of the box for silver images, this is a recipe for physical damage when trying to access the albums. And this is the sort of damage that you can see in the adjacent image that you might end up with. This is the sort of compromise damage that I see in collections that call me in. A squashed, damaged album on top of a non-conservation box, almost inevitably containing different types and sizes of material. Cased photographs, often making up a small part of collections, are sometimes packed in alongside other materials in this sort of situation, leading to the kind of physical damage that you can see here. And here you can see another example of the physical risks to objects of mixing material. You've got prints in Melanex sleeves on top of lantern slides with some old housing material on top. These boxes are commonly found in large numbers with collections of glass negatives. They are the boxes which the new plates were originally supplied in, but chemically and physically they're bad news for the negatives. The boxes become brittle, the fibres form dust, the boxes split, causing this sort of damage that happens when someone takes the boxes off the shelf, and they also cause this sort of silver deterioration often starting at the edges as the gases and dust from the degrading board penetrate that way. And the boxes may in some cases be of interest in themselves, for example for the processing instructions or photographer's annotations, but they're not good for storage. Other examples of poor quality materials which should be removed are papers like this, where you can see the effect on the silver image and also materials like this. This is PVC sleeves used for housing film negatives. PVC can break down forming hydrochloric acid and the plasticizers can also seep out, causing the gelatin to become tacky and the sleeves to stick to the photographs. This is a type of horror story which has so far been fairly poorly documented perhaps because they were often used for family photographs and not art or institutional photographs. They're often known as magnetic albums for some reason and were popular in the 1970s and 80s. Sometimes the adhesive becomes brittle and the print becomes loose. Often it becomes tacky and welds to the back of the print, making it difficult to remove. 
The pages are often prone to a pinkish mould growth and the adhesive often causes a pinkish stripy discoloration. So this is definitely a candidate for rehousing the prints where possible. This is an example of inadequate protection for framed prints. They should either be hung on vertical metal racking or at least have sturdy vertical shelving partitions. Plastazote, an inert foam, can be used to provide additional cushioning. In the case of plastic glazing instead of glass, it's a good idea to keep wrapping materials away from the surface of the glazing. So what should we use for photographs that need rehousing? Storage materials which can be recommended basically fall into two groups, papers or boards and plastics. Paper or board which is directly next to the photograph should conform to the following criteria. High alpha cellulose content, approximately neutral pH, undetectable reducible sulphur content, and free of lignin, buffers, metal particles, acid peroxides and harmful sizing agents. Often you will also see a recommendation that they pass the photographic activity test known as the PAT test. The most widely used plastic material for enclosures in conservation is polyester, often referred to as melanex or mylar. However, some grades of polyethylene and polypropylene are also acceptable. Any plastic used should be free of plasticizer and the surface should not be glazed or coated, particularly when directly against the surface of a photograph. As to what kind of things should be stored in what kind of enclosure, glass negatives are best stored vertically in four flat paper enclosures and then in boxes or drawers in cabinets. Photographic boxes are best made from board which fulfills the criteria I've just mentioned, although it can have a buffered outer layer as long as it fulfills the other criteria. Calcium carbonate buffering is fairly unlikely to dissolve and be an issue unless it is directly against the surface of some photographs. As for black and white film negatives, black and white film based material from the mid 1960s onwards in good condition can be stored in polyester sleeves in photographic storage boxes or in a hanging file system in metal cabinets. The box string binder style of storage like this is often preferred. Chromogenic colour film negatives and transparencies, certainly dating from before the mid-1980s, are recommended to be in cold storage, but more modern chromogenic material, although better in cold storage, can be kept in a similar system. These kinds of sleeves can be transferred to outer cold storage packaging later if required, provided sizes match and we'll talk more about environmental recommendations in a moment. Most people would prefer to store prints in see-through sleeves and they can be stored in polyester sleeves with photographic conservation paper or board as a support if necessary or in window mounts. They can then be placed in conservation boxes as required. Exceptions are prints with delicate surfaces such as flaking emulsion or lifting pigments which may lift off further in the presence of polyester. These should be placed in fitted paper enclosures or window mounts. Early photographic albums often have raised decoration or clasps or may be in poor condition. In this instance they will benefit from being put in a conservation drop front box like you see here made to measure in-house or by a supplier, or in a book shoe. So what about wider housing issues? Shelving and cabinets need to be suitably physically robust, as well as chemically inert for photographs. As you can see here, this sort of cheap shelving is not up to the job and could easily collapse damaging photographs and people. All cabinets or shelving should be made of metal with a baked enamel or powder coated finish. Anodized aluminium is also suitable as a finish, but steel is necessary to take substantial weights. Plastazote, an inert sheet foam, can be used to line shelves or drawers or partitions in order to soften hard surfaces. As with boxes, old wood may be relatively safe, new wood must be avoided, especially if it has been bleached or freshly painted. 
There are a number of environmental factors affecting the preservation of photographs, temperature, relative humidity, air purity and light. These next slides show some of the types of deterioration which might be more obvious when photographs have been or are in a poor environment. The photograph on the left shows characteristic fading in the highlights and redox spots caused by sources of oxidation and exacerbated by high temperatures and humidities. On the right you have similar examples showing fading again in the highlights. Here you have examples of glass deterioration caused by environmental factors with photographs. High humidity levels speeded up by high temperatures. Here you've got examples of film deterioration. On the left you've got cellulose nitrate and on the right cellulose acetate. And to achieve that level of deterioration in cellulose nitrate it has to have been in a very poor environment at some stage. However, for some 1950s cellulose acetate, room temperature will be quite adequate to cause the deterioration you see on the right hand side. Fading of some chromogenic dyes can take place in the dark, but mostly it is high light levels that will cause this, particularly when combined with high temperatures and humidity in the presence of oxidising gases. In the 1990s, considerable research was carried out, particularly at the Smithsonian Institution by Mark McCormick Goodhart, into the optimum environment to keep photographs. This defined an area of physically safe environmental parameters within which any physical changes in photographs are elastic. That means reversible. So for example, curls will uncurl, but there should be no cracking of emulsions. And you can see that the area is defined here by the quadrant A, B, C, D. Of course, if you move an object with no airtight enclosure from plus 25 degrees centigrade to minus 25 degrees centigrade within the physically safe area, you will get localised changes at the surface of an object, which will exceed the recommended maximum level of relative humidity. And later we'll look at how you get around that with cold storage. Within this physically safe area, there are greatly varying degrees of chemical stability, as you can see. Damage which may take one year to reach a set point in the line marked 1 is estimated to take 500 years in the conditions represented by the line marked 500 at the bottom. Varying only the level of relative humidity and keeping the temperature the same within the physically safe area will only decrease or increase the chemical rate of stability by a factor of 2 or 3. However, altering the temperature within this area while keeping the relative humidity the same will have a very significant effect, increasing or decreasing the chemical stability 10 or 100 fold at least. Those with collections already housed in a tightly controlled relative humidity range 35 to 40% will see that this range falls within the physically safe relative humidity parameters at any temperature within 25 degrees centigrade to minus 25 degrees centigrade. However, those designing photographic storage areas may wish to achieve an increase in chemical stability more easily and sustainably by taking advantage of the broader physically safe relative humidity range and having a lower temperature. And seasonal variations may be practical to incorporate too. The beneficial effect of dropping the temperature by even a small amount can clearly be seen. And this fact also underlines the considerable advantage to be gained by cold storage for more unstable material. And I should also mention that relative humidity levels above 65% will also lead to mould growth. Now I'll just say a few words about cold storage. Some material, namely black and white cellulose esters prior to the early 1960s, are likely to need sub-zero freezer conditions for long-term storage. Later cellulose esters and chromogenic film and print should be stored at around 2 degrees centigrade whilst black and white polyester film, glass negatives, black and white and pigment prints 
can be stored together at a cool room temperature. The photographic material should be stored in a humidity controlled cold vault or in an auto defrost freezer in purpose made sealed packaging and it's imperative that it is inserted and sealed in the packaging whilst in and adapted to the physically safe environmental conditions I've just described. Provided that the photographs are brought up to room temperature whilst in seal packaging to avoid condensation, the acclimatisation period for some packaging kits, which are about as thick as you can see in these examples, need only be two to three hours. Obviously it's cost effective and more sustainable to purchase packaging which can be reused as you can see here. The process of acclimatising photographs to room temperature and replacing them in cold storage should not cause physical damage provided condensation is avoided. However, frequent periods of use at room temperature involving the removal of an object from cold storage will clearly lessen the advantage of the increased chemical stability provided by cold storage. For many institutions, an auto defrost freezer will be sufficient to house a distinct collection rather than a cold store and also more practical and sustainable. Now I just want to say a few words about light and display. In theory, photographs would cease to be light sensitive after the image is created, but that doesn't always happen. And there is a spectrum of light sensitivity across different photographic processes. At one end of the scale, you have halide fixed photogenic drawings, each one handmade, which may show a just noticeable difference to the human eye after three to four hours at 50 lux, say 150 to 200 lux hours. At the other end of the spectrum you have a well-processed silver gelatin developed out print on a fibre base which should be relatively stable by comparison. An annual acceptable level for display of a well-processed example surrounded by a good environment and materials could be up to 84,000 lux hours so you can see quite a difference. Within some processes themselves, there can also be variability as improvements or adaptations were made or depending on the lab or photographer and the quality of the processing. The condition can also affect the light sensitivity and there may be other secondary coloured materials present such as, for example, tints in the paper base or retouching. UV levels should always be kept below 75 microwatts per lumen and blinds can be used to reduce light levels and also photographs should not be on permanent display but should be rotated. Now I'll just say a few words here about air pollution and air purity. A number of chemicals present in the atmosphere are capable of oxidising image silver and affecting other photographic materials. These include peroxides, ozone, sulphur containing compounds and nitrogen oxides. Sources of these include some paints and varnishes, cleaning agents, photocopying machines, woolen carpets and new wood. And building work and redecoration can introduce significant quantities of contaminants and it's a good policy to keep photographs out of freshly decorated rooms for a month or preferably two. I'd like to end with some general points about handling. Use two hands when carrying photographs or support them in a tray and avoid touching the emulsion. Do not use adhesive tape, staples, pins, paper clips and rubber bands. Do not try to remove photographs which are stuck to adjacent material and do not try to flatten or unroll curled prints. These are jobs for the conservator and always write captions on the back of prints or on enclosures in HB pencil. To know what's likely to happen with your collection in future, it's necessary to have some idea of what sorts of photographs are present. And that's in part why I've spent the previous webinars exploring photographs in more depth. I've also attempted to show you how to appreciate photographs and how to understand them more fully and I hope you agree that they're worth your appreciation and care. So thank you for listening. <laughs>